If your child is a victim of bullying, it can definitely be hard to know what to do. You want to protect them and make it stop, but you also don't want to make the situation worse. So how do we have that conversation? What should we talk about? And how can we empower our kids to stand up to bullying? My name is Jalen McKenna. And with me, as always, is Nick Gumpert, your host of the Beyond Real Estate Podcast. And in this week's episode of Hashtag Dad Life, we'll be discussing how to talk to your kids about bullying. We're covering cyber, emotional, and physical bullying, bystander power, and how best to report bullying both as a parent and a child. We'll also give you some tips on how you can help your child build resilience so they can thrive in spite of bullies. Be sure to check out the show notes to download a free bullying resource checklist. So if you have kids in school or have kids that will soon be going off to school, you won't want to miss this episode of Hashtag Dad Life. Welcome to Beyond Real Estate with Jayla, the podcast discussing parenting, real estate, and business. Every week we go in depth on how to become successful in business and life. Jalen, take it away. So let's jump right into the big scary thing of the actual bullying itself. I don't have kids that are in school yet. However, even if you take your kids to the playground, there's those instances where you're like, how do I step in and how do I confront these kids that are being a little bit more loose with the term play. Nick, I first want to throw something at you. Was cyberbullying or when was the first time you heard the term cyberbullying? Probably maybe high school, for sure college, but it definitely was not a thing when I was in elementary and middle school that I know for a fact. Yeah, it's definitely become more prominent as more families have, they got to turn to the electronics, right? You have your tablets, you have the phones. I'm sure texting used as a bully device was used very soon after texting became a commonplace source of communication or form of communication. So let's talk first to the more traditional versions, emotional and physical bullying. Let's talk about kind of what those look like, both emotional and physical. I'll go with physical if you want to cover some of what you can look out for in the emotional aspect of things. So physical, first and foremost, you have bruises. You have someone physically manipulating your kid, whether that's pushing them down a slide when they don't want to, or even if it's something as what seems to be as mundane as controlling their movement, telling your child or having your child tell another kid, you need to do this, or we need to go play with that over there and physically moving them over there. Those are probably not traditional versions of what people think is physically bullying, but when you're making someone do something they don't want to do, that is by definition bullying them. Nick, when someone is worried about the emotional toll and from emotional bullying, what do they need to be on the lookout for when it comes to those kind of signs or actions? Yeah, I think body language is definitely a common one with the emotional, right? It's how someone holds themselves because for someone who's gone through it, whether it be a kid or, or an adult, they tend to slouch over quite a bit. They tend to be less talkative based on a, a lack of confidence, a lack of willingness to speak up because maybe probably a lot of times when someone's emotionally be, been emotionally abused, they've been told they're not good enough. They're not good enough to be a part of a group. So naturally, but it puts people into a shell from a social standpoint. I think those are a couple of the emotional pieces that come to mind. Like I said, so body language and again, the unwillingness to, to speak up in, in the social crowds. Absolutely. And that kind of reserved feeling and social distancing that you get for any kind of bullying, whether that's cyber, emotional or physical. Now let's jump into the cyber aspect of things. So this is definitely one that's become more prominent and we'll be talking more on, on how to let your kids understand when they're being bullied. Cause that's always a concern for most parents is how do I make sure my kids step away from that bad interaction? How do I make sure that they know that they're in a bad circumstance or bad situation? When it comes to cyberbullying, I think you definitely get more of that emotional toll of someone, again, to what Nick said, putting you down, saying that you're not good enough. If you listen to any live chat of people playing video games, you very quickly see how emotional bullying plays into that, whether that's picking on a person for whatever reason, their nationality, accent, and whether they're a boy or a girl, sadly enough in the gaming community, just girls get a bad rap. And so what are some thoughts that you have, Nick, to talk with your kids about 
the cyberbullying aspect and how can parents go about putting some limits on that to better know and better or to have better control of that cyber world that we find our kids in more and more every single day. Sure. Two things come to mind on the receiving end. One, limit their exposure. I think it becomes a much more dangerous place when that becomes a place where they're just spending hours upon hours because the likelihood of them encountering it becomes more, more likely and you're increasing the odds. So number one, have a set time limit, I think is perfectly, it needs to happen. Not nor just normal. It needs to happen yeah. versus them just being on online for endless amounts of time Two, I think anytime we can be proactive as parents to have these conversations before they happen and definitely nip it in the bud when it happens. With that being said, you also have to have created established communication lines with your kid for them to feel comfortable to come to you as a parent. I think sometimes we word things a certain way. They pick up on our cues as parents. And sometimes we not on purpose, but create these boundaries and create walls that they don't want to come to us. So I think that's yep. an important thing to remember. And then on the flip side, I think parents that are dealing with their kid being bullied have to remember if someone's giving off that much negativity, the unfortunate reality is that's coming from a dark place and you don't know what their household is like and how healthy or unhealthy that is. So as easy it is, as it is, I think to say that's a bully and you don't want to mess around with them. I think the unfortunate part is you don't know what their, no their normal is. And if they're hearing those things a lot and they're exposed to it a lot, unfortunately that's beyond our control and that's their norm. So I think that's the other piece to also address with kids. In, in terms of perspective, piggybacking right off of that, let's go right into bystander power. So teaching your kids that they do have power as someone that is just a witness to bullying and to what extent they can use that power for. So this can include going and reporting the bullying, which we'll get to in a moment, or it can be intervening on behalf of someone that's being bullied, whether that's creating physical separation between them and their bully or standing up for them when they see that they are being bullied. Having someone in your corner gives you a lot more strength as a victim than if you feel like you're going it alone. And even just knowing someone is willing to step in should give your kids more power and confidence when they see something like that happen. So you as a parent giving them that authority to say, if you see someone being bullied, please step in on behalf of that other kid's behalf and either put yourself physically in between the two if they're getting physically abused, if they're being emotionally abused and you're seeing that stand up for the other child. And if they see it in the cyber world where they're playing maybe games with someone and someone is overreacting and lashing out at them for gameplay or for whatever reason, that it's okay for them to speak up on that person's behalf. Nick, I know in the soccer world, I'm sure you saw this a lot because as with any competitive anything with competition, you're going to have kids that pick on either the worst kid on the team, or you're going to see some kids be physically taken out during the course of the sporting event. How did you as a coach go about handling those situations? To be honest, I didn't have many scenarios that dealt with bowling, to be honest with the girl's side or the boy's side. Not to say I, I handled it perfectly prior to, but those types of scenarios we would definitely talk through as a team off of the field to talk about what was important in terms of how we communicated to each other, not taking things personally, how our tone of voice can be portrayed differently depending on what situation we're in. And in the sporting environment, that how we talk to each other is going to be and needs to be different than how you would talk to someone in a classroom at school. And I condoned bad language. I always nipped that one in the bud straight away and said, look, there's no place for it. If you want to do it amongst yourself and your friends and in your household, I can't control that, but I can control here on the field. Because I dealt with a lot of these types of topics up front, I didn't deal with any of it, to be honest. There's no negative story that I can honestly share to say this situation was just a tough one to deal with. But that's me and my experiences. It's not to, I can't speak for everybody, but that's what I can speak on behalf of. You pointed out just to what we are talking to, that it's more the power of setting those expectations, 
telling everyone exactly what bullying looks like and what that looks like amongst team teammates and also the opposing team and that you won't stand for it from any of your team members. And so that then creates an atmosphere of everyone else on the team to understand that's just not an option for them to do. And if they were to do it, there would be consequences. And I'll uh, piggyback on that real quick because something that I was very mindful to never do very few absolutes I can say I never did, but this is one of them, is have that passive aggressive tone with some of our players, because I think coaches unfortunately <laughs> can say one thing and then they'll start nitpicking at certain players. I think it's more unintentional in terms of they don't recognize they're doing it, but they'll naturally hone in on one or two players that mess up more often than others and they'll have little digs. And I think that environment is conducive to more kids ganging up saying well, coach is doing it so we can pick on that kid. And like I said, I don't think it's purposely done. Nonetheless, I think those situations start small and they can get big real quick. And now all of a sudden you have that bullying environment, but not many, maybe those individuals don't look at it as that because it's just a joke. It's just kidding. And just, I'm just messing with you. Yep. And now you're writing that gray area that I think a lot of teenagers and kids struggle with is, are they my friend or aren't they? And I think the ability to decipher that is you, if you can tell them to stop and they stop, a friend is going to stop versus yep. those kids that keep doing it and keep doing it. They need to, there needs to be a discussion there because friends, good <laughs> friends don't keep doing that. Good friends will say, look, I took it too far. My bad. That's my fault. And again, they know when to stop. So I think that's a, real, a very real thing. And I think it's important also to talk with your kids about that if their actions are being portrayed as being a bully or if the, if, you know, you as a parent see this bystander power goes for you as well. Cause if you see your kid being a bully or not acting in the way that you understand a good human being acts towards another person, whether that's friend or stranger, you need to understand that it's your responsibility to step in on that other person's behalf and explain to your child what happened there explain to them that what they're doing is going to be portrayed as negative and hurtful to the other person. Us as parents, we can't just say, we'll address it when my kid does it or my kid would never do that. It's we're not only showing our kids on a daily basis how to go about not bullying others, but also explaining what a good friend or family member or whatever looks like. And then especially with sports, as Nick was saying, those, the coach that, that everyone knows who the worst player on the team is. And so if you're just going day in and day out and not really propping that worst kid on the team up, or as a coach, giving that kid more opportunities or equal opportunities, I should say, to prove themselves, even if they don't prove themselves, but still giving them those opportunities to show, no, even though they're not doing well, it doesn't mean that I'm going to now treat them as an outcast. You're going to see everyone else on the team interact more positively with that team member. And when they do have a success, the entire team is now really happy for the success versus every time they strike out or every time they miss a pass, they're now getting, everyone's rolling their eyes. Cause of course they would do that because they're the worst player on the team. I really love that. And especially in sports, it's really competitive, lots of emotion. And so knowing how to handle that and setting those expectations before competition is very important when it comes to bullying because that bleeds into everywhere. These are every, kids on their team. Generally, they go to school with them too, and it can unravel from there. So now let's go to reporting bullying because I think this is something that a lot of us struggle with where we see something, maybe we say something, but it keeps happening. So what are some steps that we as parents can take? And what are some steps that we can ensure our kids know are available to them when bullying is being witnessed? So I'll start off first with knowing who the person in power is, whether that's the teacher, whether that's the organizer of the little league, someone that doesn't have emotion directly. And so they can have be a neutral voice in what's happening and see whether or not there's actual bullying. Cause I think sometimes there's always that like my kid is being bullied and it's not really your kid being bullied in some instances, not every instance, maybe your kid's being sensitive. Like we're, we try to take a middle of the road approach here. Whereas 
the kid is being verbally abused and they're getting pushed around every day or they're being talked down to by other students or by other adults. You know, understanding that differentiation, but also understanding who to go to is very key there. Nick, who's another position of power that you think is a good go-to in your experience when acknowledging that bullying is happening and actually fixing the issue? That's a tough one based, based on the fact that each environment is a little bit different, right? When you're at school at recess, that's a much different go-to than when you're at tr soccer training and there's one coach and 17 players training. So I guess my first answer is the closest adult, if you're that kid, that closest adult in proximity, right? Again, if you're at recess at school, it's which adult or teacher is on site that you can conf confide in, tell, explain what happens. And if yep. you're at your sporting event, it's that coach that ultimately has the oversight. I think the tough part, of course, then becomes you're explaining the situation and there's, I didn't see it, right? Or I didn't hear it. I think that's the tough part because again, it yeah. creates a totally different perspective for someone who did not witness any of it, see any of it, even if it was a coach and well, their eyes and attention is somewhere else. And there's, I didn't just see him right now, just shove you three times. I'm sorry. That that's real life, right? It happens at soccer trainings, at yeah. baseball trainings, at football trainings, et cetera. When you have close to 20 ish kids or in football trainings, you have more than that, but that's my long winded answer for saying that closest adult for kids involved. And then if you're that parent. I yeah. guess the go-to is going to that neutral source that, that you alluded to because you have a little bit different perspective as the parent. It's so easy to get emotionally wrapped up into it. And so the ideal situation is getting someone who's unbiased to the situation and say, let's get the whole picture, not just one version of it. And let's, yeah. let's talk this through to see where things lie. And the first adult is definitely big because they're the closest proximity person with power. but also just making them aware that something is happening is a better chance that something won't happen later. And not to say that there aren't those kids and adults that <laughs> complain and whine if they just don't get their way and they consider that's now bullying and that now they're being picked on or what have you, which we'll get to the resilience, building your child's resilience portion of this. And we'll touch on that as well. But you as a parent, just make a, just be aware to what Nick said, understand that you can miss some things. Don't start jumping to conclusions one way or the other of what happened, but also just be aware of the situation and that a situation might be happening. And I think something that, again, we'll talk to here in a second, right after this is open those lines of communication so that your kid understands who first to go to in the situation. And then later after the situation, Make sure that they're comfortable with bringing up that a situation like that happened, whether that be at the sporting event or at school, so that you as a parent understand what's happening and you're not surprised a few months down the road when a teacher comes up to you and says, hey, this has been happening with your son or daughter for X amount of months, because that's a feeling of hopelessness that it's like my kid has been suffering for this entire time and I didn't even know what was happening. Let's just jump into that now, actually. Building your child's resilience. Nick said it first, open those communication lines of communication. And Nick, what are some ways, I know we've talked about it briefly in other episodes of Hashtag Dad Life, but what are some ways as a parent that you can effectively open those communication, those lines of communication with your kids? And when's the best time to bring this up? And I'll say the final thing is what are your next steps in the action plan when you find out that bullying is happening to your kid or potential bullying is happening? Yeah, I think best time to open the lines of communication up is before it even happens. I think, unfortunately, a lot of parents wait for something to happen and then that spurs the conversation. Yeah. I think if you can be out of that emotional state of whether it be your kid is the victim or the antagonist then it's easier to role play a little bit and play pretend. Hey, if this is happening, how would you react if this started happening? The challenge always with role play is it, it, you're not in the moment, right? So it's easier to talk through it versus actually do it. Nonetheless, you're starting to create a habit. You're starting to build awareness for what is the appropriate way and the best way to, to deal and handle the situation. And then as a parent, I think for all of us, we hope that our kid hung on to <laughs> some important pieces, important chunks, so that if and when they are in that situation, they have 
something to pull from. They have a reference point. And then that's where my head goes. And then when it comes to building that resilience, so to speak, I think getting him to understand control the controllables. You can't control everything that comes out mm -hmm. of someone's mouth. You can't control what they do to you, but you can always control how you react. And no matter how you might be feeling emotionally, you're always responsible for how you react to something. Feeling really pissed off is not an excuse to punch somebody in the face. I can still <laughs> control how I react to that individual. <laughs> and now is it a breathing thing? Is yep. it just me turning my back and walking away? Uh, again, those things need to be talked through. So hopefully you don't have the conversation after the fact. <laughs> Say, Jalen, <laughs> punching him in the face is not a good answer when he said something <laughs> about your sister. And now you're having that conversation again, <laughs> after the fact. Yeah. The, and that's a call no parent ever wants to have is your kid was brought into the principal's office because they punched right. the kid in the face. <laughs> the other kid better have deserved it. Otherwise, this is going to be a really hard conversation. Well, they're, they're good. Even if <laughs> so, they deserved it. It's that understanding yeah. of there's different ways to handle a, a situation. Because I think we can all agree. Oh, yeah. I don't know. Nine, 10, 11, 12 to yeah. a punch in the face really doesn't need to be the first reaction to handle this situation. You better have been doing this in self-defense on another kid that yeah. was getting wailed on. That's the, that's really the, in my opinion, that's the only reason that you're swinging, yeah. using physical yeah. violence or yeah. As if someone else that you're saving someone else from just getting ass whooped yeah. on a daily basis yeah. and you're stepping in and then at that point, the boys and I are going out to ice cream. If that's <laughs> what ends up happening and they now get whatever their suspension is, because that's how schools are nowadays right. is both right. parties get suspended, whether you were right. the one that took the punch or you were the one right. that threw right. the punch, you're both getting suspended. It's like, they now have three days of vacation. We're going to go do fun stuff on these days <laughs> if they're in the right. Now, if your kid's in the wrong, I think it goes back to the open lines of communication and you as a parent coming into it as a neutral body, understanding that your kid may have messed up or they could be in the right, but not making any judgments until you hear all sides that you have access to. So whether that's the teacher's side or the other adult side of what happened and your child's side, and then draw your own conclusions. But it's, I would say it's not a fair, it's not fair for you to come in and start punishing your kid or not punishing your kid just because of your own perception of, oh, my son never would do that. Or my daughter is always just picking on people that I told her this would happen. It's for, we're, we're advocates for our kids, but being an advocate doesn't mean that you either side with them or disagree with them on every single circumstance. Nick, I think we had a really nice productive conversation here. I'll let you have, if you have any final thoughts, I'll let you finish up with the, let you uh, get those out there and then I'll wrap yeah, up this episode. One, one last thing I'll add is trust and bullying are similar in that it's always in the eye of the beholder, right? It's the person you're trying to do something to. So if I say, Jalen, trust me, I can never determine that's always coming from Jalen. And if we're talking about this bullying yep. situation, it's never the person doing it to determine whether or not I'm doing the bullying. It's the person I'm doing it to. And I think that's the reality when we're trying to decipher, I'm not a bully. It's not in the eyes of you, is it? <laughs> it's who's on that receiving end of it. And I think that's what also gets a lot yeah. of translation sometimes is where that determination comes into play. And it goes back to, again, if someone's telling you to stop or asking someone to stop, that understanding of saying, okay, I need to stop. And if you don't, and it becomes a continuing thing that you're making someone do, as you said at the very beginning, you're forcing them to do something they don't wanna do. Now it's, now it's an issue. Right. So just again, perspective matters. Perspective. Keep that in. Keep that in mind. Nick, great final thoughts. That's it for this week's episode of Hashtag Dad's Life. We really hope that you found it helpful and informative. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to reach out to us on social media or at either one of our emails. All that is linked below. And of course, there's a comment section, whether that's on this podcast page or YouTube, wherever you're listening to us. And if you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe to the podcast and leave us a review. It goes a long way towards helping grow the show. Thanks so much for listening. And we will see you on Wednesday where we'll be discussing tips for first time home buyers. If you're interested in buying a home, whether that's next month or next year, you'll definitely want to tune in for this. Thanks so much. And see you then. Want to see, hear, or listen to more of Nick's take on California real estate market? Check out my links below. Also, check out the links below for more information on products, books, or references made in this podcast. And please don't forget to subscribe, like, and share.